This is Jen Rubin. Welcome to Jen Rubin's Green Room. You know, a funny thing happened to me last week. I was going about my business, writing my column. I wrote what I thought was a pretty good column about Christiana Ampour, who is the CNN international correspondent. She went to Columbia University, gave a wonderful graduation speech in which she talked quite a bit about that disastrous town hall that her network ran. And kudos to her. She really laid it out there, what was wrong with it. And moreover, she really kind of stuck it to CNN in explaining what they should be doing, calling them back to live up to their highest aspirations, the way Ted Turner had created the station uh, and the network so many years ago. So I thought there was no better person to help us figure out why CNN was attacking me, what's wrong with CNN, what's wrong with the rest of the media, and get some insight into the slowly heating up Republican primary. So I have with me a very good friend, Matthew Dowd. Matt, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Jennifer. Matt, we have known each other for so long. I think we were both Republicans (laughs) at the time we first met. So here's the question I want to start with. What would possess CNN, which is a big, big entity, to take an issue that was clearly a face plant for them? Clearly they had screwed up, but weeks had passed, the furor had died down. What would possess them to suddenly pick up the cudgel and start beating me over the head with an irate tweet um, calling me shameful, disparaging the fact that I was uh, simply working at the behest of MSNBC? Of course, I had written the piece for the Washington Post. What do you think was going through their minds? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I, first, I'd like to like extend this to, you know, the first thing you do is if you've got a problem, do you understand it as an isolated problem or do you understand it as something far deeper? And what CNN seems to have done is they think it's an isolated problem of a one event thing. And that's one, I think one, the first mistake of anybody that looks at these things is, is understanding what is your real problem, which they haven't done. The second thing is, is how do you get your way out of the problem? Even if you think it's an isolated problem, and there's, you know, two methods to deal with it. There is, I mean, from a PR standpoint, the first is deal with the problem, which CNN doesn't seem to want to do or is doing. And the second is, is divert from the problem. And in that case, in, in, in where they are today and how they've especially related to you in this, in this, their response to you in this is they they're doubling down on it and not even trying to switch to something else, um, which is an amazing strategy for somebody where the data shows uh, that the response of the public, especially the news public to what has happened is, is incredibly bad for them just from a profit standpoint. It's almost as if the CNN chief, Chris Leck, read my piece, had a temper tantrum, a meltdown, called down to the PR department and said, somebody slam her. And they rooted around for someone to do the dirty work. They finally turned up someone and they sent out this rather um, silly tweet. Well, you know what? I I don't know if you know Chris. I don't know Chris at all. I just know from his bio where where he's come from. Um, This is to me, you know, an ongoing thing of people that enter into this space still assuming the, the point in our country, in our democracy is the same it's always been. And so they're just gonna keep doing what they think has, was, was always, I guess, the right thing to do in this case. And so I don't know his emotional standing in this. Obviously he was hired to do a job for CNN and the way you judge that job is ratings. From that only, from that only metric, he's not doing a good job from that take aside the more important problem, which is defense of our democracy, which includes freedom of the press, it, which I also don't think he's doing a very good job on. So I don't know what his even strategic approach to the CNN brand is or was to think he's gonna position himself in a place where he can have that success. The irony is that that's what Amon Poor was talking about. She was taking them back to the onset of CNN and telling them, this is where our heart and soul is. It's in making news. It's in reporting news. Yep. 
she quoted the original mission. That was pretty nervy of her. She's telling her boss he's lost his way and this is where they should go, back to hard news reporting. Yeah, I mean, um, she's absolutely right. And props to her. I mean, it, that, that obviously took real courage for her to do that within an organization, as it did for who the, the, the man who reported on the media event, who then was, I guess, shut down after he reported accurately on the blowback. Oliver Darcy, I think, was the Yeah, on gentleman. the media event. Props to him, too, for doing that until he was shut down. And that she's absolutely right. I, I mean, I, I have for years believed in the idea of presenting both sides, that, that idea that if you present both sides who are speaking from a common set of facts and have a common set of values, but have different opinions, conservatives and liberals, as you and I know, have, can, can debate these things and all that and if you're coming from a principled fact stand. So I believe the presentation of two sides actually gets you closer to the truth. That's not our reality today. That is not our reality. It's, it's a reality that both doesn't have a common set of facts. So one side will try to, even if it's left or progressive, will actually pro present their policies with a fact set. That, so there's not even a common set of facts. There, there is facts on one side, lies on the other, but there's no even agreement on a common set of values, um, a belief in a democracy where you present, you know, the sort of wisdom of the crowds. And by the wisdom of the crowds, you arrive at, you know, you know, what you're supposed to arrive at, that doesn't exist. So you have not only, you have lies on one side, you have it no longer a belief in democracy and CNN keeps operating as if a present presentation of facts on one side, lies on the other will get us to the truth, which ought to be the ultimate goal of journalism. That's so true. You know, they have these panel discussions. They put on a Jamie Raskin who talks about the Constitution, talks about uh, the legal state of affairs. And then on the same program, they put on Jim Jordan, who is a legal anarchist. And they would have us believe that these two people are operating on an equal intellectual, moral level. Well, first, I want to one thing I want to say is you and I, I think, both appear and do things for MSNBC. I've never de denied that M and MSNBC has a leaning, right? I, 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 and I, that's, I think, true and obvious. They're not a conservative broadcast channel, but that doesn't mean MSNBC with a leaning doesn't try to present things according to fact. And if they're wrong, they'll say they're wrong and move on to the ne next thing. That's a huge difference between every time people say, well, they do this on the left and they do this on the right. Well, that's actually not true. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I think you raise a point that is very important that I don't think many people have said, which is one could argue that what CNN is currently doing is actually worse than what Fox is doing. One could make the argument because what Fox is doing is pretty clear and patently open and everybody seems to understand it that they, they're gonna say whatever they want to accomplish whatever their goals are and present it in such a way, whether it's lies or not, that's who they are. And so people have a frame of reference, especially people that passively receive their news that might switch around, kind of have a, a, a frame of reference on Fox. The problem CNN has, has is there's this faux sense of objectivity that when people listen to it and then they hear this two sides, of, of Jim Jordan and, and Jamie Raskin, they think that's like, that's, they're just two sides to it and therefore I, they have to figure out which one is, is that they should lean more towards. And that to me does a graver disservice in this moment, in my view, than Fox News does. And why do they keep doing this? Can't they turn this around? They know what's wrong. No, but it, it, it's like, it's like turning, I think, and I've criticized Joe Biden in, in this way and some of the Democrats in this way, it's, it's, it's like turning a huge barge in the ocean, right? And their ability to understand the moment we're in has so fundamentally shifted. They're still, it took them a long time. And I think Biden has finally arrived there, but it took Biden a few years to, to fundamentally let sink in and root in himself that this isn't the Republican party from the 1980s, right? And he was still operating I think good from a good place, 
that, no, I can figure out a way, I can negotiate, I can do this, so I can get them to be reasonable, they'll accept facts, I'll make an argument, to, you know, that, that, will be, that will be the case. And I think the same is true with much of the news journalism. And I worked for ABC News, and I had this conversation very early on with Donald Trump, and I don't no longer work for ABC News, that they had to, they no longer could cover the Donald Trump in the manner with which they have covered previous presidents, right? They couldn't f adjust to it, and it took them a long time, and I don't think there's still many journalistic enterprises that have fundamentally understood that moment that we're in. And I said at that meeting, and this was early 2017, I said at that meeting at ABC News, I don't think I've ever said this before, I said that why don't we hire some people that have worked as journalists in autocratic regimes to figure out the best way to cover and be a journalist in an autocratic regime. And you would have thought I was speaking Martian. Well, you probably were. <laughs> These people cover foreign autocracies accurately. They say who's lying, who's not, but they're incapable of doing it in their own country. And, you know, it's not like they don't know what's going on. Their own cameras are covering Kevin McCarthy, as he gets out there and spins all this nonsense about the debt ceiling, it's like they don't watch their own broadcast and they just go merrily along treating this as if it's just two competing negotiating sides. Well, you know, that, that's, I, I'm glad you brought the debt ceiling up because it's such an illustration of the point and the problem in this, in the mode we're in. And the, my, my criticism also goes along with there's been this gamification of news media, which is, is that you, you, you basically, it's almost like a sports thing, like, oh, you know, the Democrats are up three or the Republicans are up four and they're like, oh, what's gonna happen? And how, wh who's gonna win? Or, or like, oh, the Democrats said this and the Republicans said this as if it's a game. And then they're just supposed to like give, put a scoreboard up and then somebody else is supposed to figure out the problem, right? Somebody else is supposed, to, as opposed to, oh, our democracy is on the line and one party, who we may not always agree with is actually the only one supporting democracy and the other party is not in that, that that's the frame of reference in this, but they gamify it in such a way that it's runs, hits and errors. And then they're just gonna sit back and say, oh, well, you know, the democracy went away, like well, let's go on to the next thing in the course of this. And that to me has been a huge part of the, of, of the problem of coverage and the debt ceiling is a perfect example of this. To me, if you really looked at the reality of this and the reality of where the Republicans are in this, they would just as soon the economy fail. I, I fundamentally believe that because in their mind, if the economy fails, and I think there's quotes today that they're basically all but saying this, if the economy fails and the Democrats and Joe Biden suffers, that's a good thing. Even if millions of people go without social security check or Medicare payments or vets go without health care. That's fine as long as we win politically in the course of this. And the media keeps reporting it's like, oh, there's, they're in negotiations in all of this, but they're not reporting it as one side is fully willing to shoot the hostage. <laughs> it's really willing to shoot the hostage to get what they want while the other side is, is please don't shoot the hostage. Can't we just get through this? And that's the, the real debate in this. It's, you, the media thinks like they can just bring this up and shame the Republicans. The Republicans are unshameable. And they've said that, they've said that. <laughs> it really is like they're afraid to take sides. Like it somehow is beyond their mission to say, this is true, this is not true. Well, and, and don't you think, Jennifer, that part, a, a big part of this is this sort of problem with access journalism that, and this is to me, I watch this unfold in the Trump White House, especially with Kellyanne Conway. And much of what was going on was people wanted, wanted to make sure that they weren't cut off from interviewing, interviewing Donald Trump or interviewing Kevin McCarthy or interviewing somebody. And so Kelly and Conway would go on the air and all that. And I, I think people fully knew well that you couldn't believe most of anything she said. And most, you know, I'm just using her as one, one example of many that that was done in order to preserve a relationship in order to get the interviews they wanted to get. It wasn't being done to provide the public with information that was factual and needed, or two, to be able to sort of hold on to the elements and the institutions of our democracy 
so that we had a free press. And that's the other part of this I don't understand. And then CNN and others is don't they understand that without the democracy, they're gone? Yeah, you know, it's funny. The press is always accused of caring too much about itself. But in this case, they should care about themselves because what they care about is free speech, which is absolutely essential to a democracy. You know, I have to watch these Sunday shows till my eyes bleed. And it's absolutely unwatchable. They put on a normal Democrat who says his bit. Then they put on a Republican who says a bunch of blather. There's no follow up. And it's completely unwatchable. You know what's funny about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's completely accurate. And that's the problem is, and I don't, it, first of all, just from a rating standpoint, I think it's the worst kind of television you can you can put together, which is, you know, it's just the C in plays where you just point it at the cow and you pull the string and it's moo and it's like, I'm not hearing anything that's create, right? So it's not even good television in my view. It's not even just take that aside. It doesn't serve the democracy. I'll tell you, something funny happened. And it, again, it was at ABC News. So I was on a Sunday show panel with Matt Schlapp, right? Um, who is head of- He has his problems. Yes, who had, was head of CP, CPAC and now he's in the midst of m multiple scandals, uh, both within the organization and personally without of this. And I knew Matt because Matt and I worked together on the 2004 campaign. So I knew Matt. So Matt's on the show. And I think he thought, I think he thought that he could just say things and we're all like everybody's whatever, buddy, buddy. And he started speaking on the show and I stopped him. And I said, George, everything that he just said is wrong. And if you gave him true serum, he would say something totally different. Everything he just said is wrong. And he got all upset. And then at break, he went in the green room. He started screaming at me like, how dare you? How dare you, you call me a liar. I said, I didn't call you a liar and did, don't be cute about it. You, I, you said, I said, I said, if you gave you truth serum, you'd be saying something totally different. And he goes, I can't believe you'd say that. I said, listen, the only, you know what the solution is to it? Speak the truth, Matt, and then I'm fine with it. And I think that unless, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in speaking truth with compassion, right? Doing it in such a way that's not, that's, that you have to speak truth, but I think you can also do it in a way that isn't uh, isn't coarse um, in the course in the in the realm of this, but I think that's the problem is is the reward system that exists in the media, especially related to access, is that people that speak truths that might offend someone is that 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 those folks then go back and say we don't want anything to do with that organization anymore, and then when the bookers call up. And they're like, we're not gonna ever put somebody on again if that person, that person, that person. And then the bookers report back, we couldn't book the, per you know, all of that system system thing that goes on in these news organizations. Those news organizations from a leadership standpoint, and which is, brings us back to Chris Lick, have to be willing to stand by their people when they're willing to speak the truth. If they don't, the learned behavior is, don't speak truth to power. You know what I think is going on? I think they're just afraid of dead time. When I was a baby lawyer, they taught me how to take a deposition where you question these witnesses or the plaintiff or defendant under oath. And they always said, ask your question and then shut up because the dead time is going to drive the person you're questioning to reveal something they otherwise wouldn't. Well, and, and you're right. It, it, so dead time reveals, dead time reveals a lot, right? Is very revelatory. Also is I don't understand, as, like, it's picking the quote unquote town hall of Donald Trump, ask the same question five times, right? Re-ask, if you don't get the answer and you think, ask it again and again. And the problem is, is they have a list of like 11 questions and they ask one and they get some BS answer or they get a total lie. Okay, we'll go on to question two. We'll go on to question three, go on to question four. I've watched European journalists do this and do it really well. There's many, you're, and they basically ask the same question seven times in a row and force the person. Yeah, and the other thing they don't do is they don't listen to the answer. There's no follow-up. If the other person says the sky is purple, don't ask them what color the grass is. Uh, and yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, I actually don't really, I mean, I wonder, I know CNN must have a mission statement, right? All these organizations have mission statements. I don't know what CNN's actual mission statement is. My guess is 
it's something that you and I would completely a thousand percent agree to, which is some idea of journalistic, you know, getting the thing, serving the American public, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure it's something we can totally agree with. Yes, and Amanpour read that. She went back to Ted Turner's original words and talked about what makes good journalism and talked about being fearless. So I think she said it. Yeah, I know. I saw that. <laughs> I just don't know how they've lost their way. Well, and, and I don't get, and that's the part, Jennifer, I don't get because, so if they just stood up and said, we're going to do this totally for profit and we're going to do this and we're going to build an audience and we're going to do this or that, great, fine, great. To tell, you know, do that. But they're not, what, I don't know what they think they're accomplishing. So they're, they're not living up to the mission statement of Ted Turner and they're not getting ratings, which is supposedly, the, you know, the, what they're worried about in this. So what is it they are actually accomplishing? So Matt, you make your living giving people advice. <laughs> what would you tell CNN? Would you tell them to go back to the old CNN? Would you have them do some kind of new CNN? So I think it has to be a new CNN. I mean, I mean, maybe there's elements of values from an old CNN, obviously, that would work in today's environment. But I, I, my pitch would be, do you agree? First of all, I'd ask a series of questions. Do you agree that democracy is at stake? My guess is most people in that organization would answer yes to that question, Right. Do you believe that you're, you hear a deluge of lies from one side more than the other? My guess is that the or, people in the organization would readily agree to that, would agree to that. Okay, that granted those things, stipulating those things at this moment in time is what is your brand in this environment to work through that, right? What is your brand in this environment to work through it? And that's where I don't, I mean, they're not, ever going to be, CNN's forever tainted by among, you know, the MAGA crowd. The MAGA crowd's never going to go to CNN, no matter how many town halls they hold of Donald Trump, right? They've, they've lost a huge chunk of what they had retained before, which was the progressive crowd here, right? And so, I, you know, you'd have to ask yourself, one, do you stipulate the answers to those questions, is what is your potential audience here and how do you appeal to that audience while simultaneously protecting the truth and democracy? And that would answer the question of what they need to do. That would answer, you know, and are you a news organization or are you an entertainment entity, right? And, and all of those answers to those questions lead you inevitably to, to my mind, to the solution or the structure that you need there. But I think they're caught in this spiral right now that unless, you know, the owners, and I don't even know where the owners of, of CNN or the stockholders or whatever want this to be in this really are. But to me, the way to rating success and, and look at, I know you and I work, work for them. And so we're not completely objective. We're subjective in this. But MSNBC, more than probably any other news organization right now has put a stake in the ground on democracy, has put a stake in the ground. And if, it, and you know, all the other things aside, they've put the stake in the ground on democracy. And the sad truth is they actually think they can get those conservative viewers back. It's nuts, but that's what they believe. <laughs> Matt, I would be totally remiss if I didn't ask you about that absolute horrifying debacle of a rollout that Ron DeSantis made on Twitter. Well, you, you know, this, that's a really, first of all, that was like, I mean, that configuration of, you know, it was SpaceX DeSantis what happened that day. I mean, it was just, it was like the perfect storm of idiocy that, that went into it. My guess is, and, and, you, and, and you've read, I'm sure a lot of this, DeSantis is such an insular group right, is such an insular group of people that I'm sure Elon Musk or somebody associated with them reached out or they think, and like, here's this billionaire and this, and he's kind of like, wants to partner up with you. And then this insular group was like, oh, isn't it great? We're gonna do this, isn't it awesome in this? And I'm, and nobody asked the questions of, do you have enough engineers to overcome problems? Haven't you fired everybody? You know, are you reliable? <laughs> are you reliable? None of that. I think it was this sort of celebritized thing with this insular group thought, oh, this is a great idea without vetting it to a, a, a group of sane strategic people that understood this. And so I think that was 
that was probably the instigation of it. I saw data today, more people went to Disney World last week than went on DeSantis' presidential announcement. More, there were more visitors to Disney World last week than were on DeSantis' announcement yesterday. Yeah, and you know, what does he think he's doing attacking Disney? Where does he think middle America goes? <laughs> well, you know, we, I, I've, I've tried, and you've probably said this before, DeSantis, the candidates on paper look really good but paper doesn't run for office, right? The paper doesn't run for office. We saw this with Scott Walker. Scott Walker, we saw this with Rick Perry, two very popular governors among, pop, among conservative groups who could raise a ton of money, who flamed out in a hurry because the, their, the candidate on the paper could not match what, what the person in person would campaign as. I think that is DeSantis' fundamental problem. He looks so good on paper, he won a big victory, he can raise a lot of money, but as soon as he engages with the public, who I will give credit for, the public, it, they may be slow and they may sometimes not always be in tune, but they figure it out. And they figure out there's something very weird about this guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really don't understand when you have a guy who doesn't relate to people, you put him on Twitter and sit him next to a weirdo billionaire. That doesn't make any sense. He need to make him more relatable in some sense to the rest of the public. Yeah, and they want somebody that emotes and they want somebody that emotes. And I mean, set aside his problem for a general election, if he were to get through the primary, which I think is a one in a million shot that he can get through the primary. I don't think it's possible in this is Republicans, they don't, I mean, that's the thing I don't think Asa Hutchinson understands. I don't think John, uh, Sununu understands. I don't think Nikki Haley understands. I don't think they, that the, the, the hunger in the Republican MAGA base is not for policy and is not for unity and it is not for hope. It is for fear, grievance and retribution. That's what they want. That's what they wanna hear. They don't want to hear about like I, they're, they're, <laughs> government, government, governance competence is not a value that the MAGA group is interested in. And that's what's so funny because DeSantis says he's now going to win this on policy. That's just nuts. Ron DeSantis is not going to win this race by a economic plan or some super duper <laughs> foreign policy plan. That, that's just not what the voters want. <laughs> Well, and that's, that brings us around to the end this, is this is uh, Donald Trump was the first to understand where the Republican Party had become in 2015 and 2016. Jeb Bush didn't understand it. Marco Rubio didn't understand it. All those candidates were running for a Republican Party that was decades old, that no longer existed. And that, I mean, it's only gotten worse. It's only gotten worse in that way since 2016, where the grievance and rise and all of this stuff has only get, become, become far worse than it has. And the me news media and CNN has even s been slower to understand the world as they knew it is gone. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Matt, for being with us. This was great. It's always great to be here. And that was Matt Dowd, the perfect voice to explain what's wrong with the mainstream media, what's wrong with CNN, and where the Republican Party is headed. I hope you'll, if you enjoyed this episode, you'll tell your friends and join us next week back on Jen Rubin's Green Room. Bye-bye. <laughs>